started with this uh, finance meeting, uh, the first finance meeting of 2022. We welcome everybody here and uh, look forward to a productive session. Uh, and our, as you know, our finances are in better shape than a lot of other years, so we just got to look at those appropriations people on the other side that spend it and try to hold them back a little bit. Uh, I, I've said Chairman Tillery is kind of like, you know, we bring in the money in this committee and they spend it. It's kind of like my household, but um, uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on him over there. <laughs> oh, well, no, I... <laughs> Ho hopefully not. Um, Compliment the Jones income. <laughs> anyway, we will start off here by our vice chair, John Albers, leading us in the invocation here. Bow your heads, please. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this uh, honor uh, to serve you uh, and to bring glory upon you. Please bless this committee, bless this work, and we do it all in your most holy name. Amen. All right. We have uh, one bill that we're going to do a hearing only today and try to get some information on this and and uh it's left over from last year and i think we have the author of the bill here if you want to go up to the podium here and present your bill and i think we're going to hear some testimony from a few people on this and we want everybody to to get everything said we can get said but not repeat the same things over and over hopefully and go from there so let's see um i think i've got you on okay Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the Senate Finance Committee. It is wonderful to be back here this afternoon to present a wonderful bill to you, uh, and that is House Bill 302. Um, I'll be brief uh, and quick here. So House Bill 302 really does only three things. Uh, number one, it says that regulatory fees can only be used for the regulatory activity, like an inspection, and that those regulatory fees cannot be used to raise revenue for the general fund. Number two. Do you, do you mind, like, we yes, kind of go through the bill when you do that and show us the line numbers? Yes, if sir. You would. Absolutely. Let me pull it up here. So the regulatory, um, kind of hammering this out, this was kind of a, uh, we just beefed this code section up. This is actually already. Uh, in line, we're just beefing it up, and so this is line 22 of your bill. So it starts uh, with the word and in line 22, and it says, And the proceeds of such regulatory fees shall be used to fund such regulatory activity and not the general operations of the local government, provided that the local government shall not be required to establish separate accounts for such proceeds. Um, number two is local jurisdictions. Uh, cannot base a regulatory fee on the cost of the actual construction job. It must be based on what it actually costs to do in an inspection. That is, uh, I'll, I'll get you out to a line number here. And that is uh, starting on line 99. And that's uh, going all the way through line 120. Uh, so you cannot base a regulatory fee on the cost of the construction job. It must be based on what it actually costs to do the inspection. Now, we, to, to be clear here, we are not eliminating uh, in, in whole uh, the way for them to collect a fee to do their job. We obviously want to make sure that they are able to do that. We're just trying to get away, I think, from the uh, some, some of these over fees that we're, we're starting to see where they're just kind of pumping up their general funds uh, without, a, without a really good reason, to be honest with you. But we do allow them to do it in four other ways, and those four ways are a flat fee uh, for each business or practitioner, uh, a flat fee for each type of permit or inspection requested, uh, an hourly rate is fine, not a big deal at all, um, and then an hourly rate with the addition of other reasonable expenses like travel costs and others. Mind if I get you to back up just a little bit? Yes, I'm sir. trying to go through it systematically. Yes, sir. And back on uh, page two, okay. you've eliminated. I see taxi cabs, shooting galleries, firearms, um, 
just just let me know what's going on there if you would yes sir so a lot of this is going to be clean uh, language i think got, they came from legislative council so you'll see on several different uh, different places uh, under line 26 that's existing language it says of business or practitioners or, or, or professions which may be subject to regulatory fees but are expressly not limited to the following and so we're just eliminating those um, that are not expressly limited to uh, and so that's number three that's number six and number eleven number number eleven on that list is then followed up and you see a number twenty two as well wrestling promoters uh, that's a clean up and then you see on uh, number 22 uh, that sport shooting ranges as a final paragraph two of subsection a and on number 23 which is firearm dealers those are clean ups uh, legislative council put those in i think uh, les schneider has some probably more information on those and he'll be uh, giving y'all testimony today on those uh, but but for the the kind of looking at this thing holistically that came from legislative council uh, as far as getting that language cleaned up um, this does not and and i, I do want to say this it clears up a conflict in state law about how those gun dealers are charged a regulatory fee but it does not eliminate the fee the, the fee is still in state law it's just a cleanup section uh, they needed to move that around uh, but it, it, it is still there in another code section. So, so you're really not part of that. You just put it in there as, as you were for cleanup. That, that's the way it come right, out well, of so we'll hear testimony yes, on that, I guess, as well. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and then if we go back to number two, uh, which is really the meat and potatoes of the bill. Uh, you see those four ways uh, that they can uh, charge a regulatory fee. And then what we're trying to eliminate is these other two that end up being kind of too egregious, right? i give an example. If I have a 6,000 square foot warehouse that's medical space, and I have a 6,000 square foot that's warehouse space, and I'm charging you by the square foot, um, obviously it's going to take you a lot more man hours, for those of you that have built anything, uh, to do a regulatory activity in that medical space. You've got, you could have oxygen lines, you could have extensive HVACs, but try doing that in a warehouse. So it's just different, right? And so these fees can just tack up, and they can be far more. They can be percentages of a multi-million dollar building, and it just, the math doesn't add up. And so you see these kind of humongous fees going back to uh, these local governments, and they're doing it to kind of pad the revenue stream for those local governments, where in state law already it says, hey, you can't charge you know these fees to put them back in your general revenue uh, as it goes from there so we're just trying to clear that out we're just trying to uh, fortify that position and uh, and move this uh, move this in the right direction all right and then those that can be charged I'm looking at that list you took out boxing is that a cleanup too or uh, that's line 50 Let's see and while you're looking for that, I see we got massage parlors, escort services, lawyers, and dentists all lumped together here. Well, I'll be honest with you, Mr. Chairman. Unfortunately, I think they, they, they usually do. Car you left them out. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. Okay. All right. Sorry. We're, we're talking about boxling. I, I, I digressed. I want to know the important Yeah. <laughs> So the, the boxing is a cleanup as well. Let me see the box. Yeah, the boxing. Let me go back. It's been it's been a little while since I've looked over this. Uh, so I think again we go back. So this says under line 26, the sample of business of practitioners or professions or occupations which may be subject to, mm -hmm. right, but are not expressly limited to. And all they're doing is I think they're removing that, right. So, that, and, and I think this was again uh, from from Les Schneider. And the, all we're saying is. They don't have to be subject to, right? This this is not a, a mutually exclusive, you know. They they can be, they don't have to be. All right. I, I'll be quite honest with you. At looking at that whole list, and saying, I, I don't really like those double negatives, you know. To begin with, it says, but are not expressly or but are expressly not limited to the following. I mean, it, you know, it's okay. You can, but you can't. Well, that's great. We put that in state law. 
I, either way you look at it, you know, you, you either can or you can't, but we're not saying which which way or the other. So you know how bills are written around here. All right. Um, Senator Jackson was just telling me he's running late, so we were talking about Dennis in his absence. His ears must have been burning because he just <laughs> texted me. Um, so uh, Albers, Senator Albers has a question, and let me ask yes, one. Sir here you were talking earlier about people padding their general fund um have you got examples of that or the uh, city of atlanta okay that's right so uh ha have you have you got s some sort of financial sh i mean i i, I know I, i'm not saying yeah. it does or doesn't exist but i know the law says it's an enterprise fund that you you pay for that's right you yeah. pay for this department what you know what if so, it's if they rent the building if they bought the building utilities that's whatever right. I, I, administrative i think the example that i give you is some of these types of funds that you're speaking of uh here right here in city of atlanta they took them they took you know a thousand dollars to remove a tree or move a tree or whatever it may be or they took the fees and the overages for these percentages on these big mega buildings y'all see being built around here and what they did really was and it, it they said look we got all this money over here uh but at the threat of our you know bond rating or whatever we're gonna move that money to the you know, into these uh, general fund. And, and really, it just becomes a cash cow for the city. Okay. To be my, frank. Um, it, and, and we can pull that information if we need Yeah, to. it might be good before. We're, sure. You know, we're going to, as a hearing on today, that might be some information that would we'll be good to get before yeah. then. Um, okay. Senator Albers, you've got questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, helping out my good friend, Representative, I believe if you two, three, and four is just cleanup language for items that are referenced in another area of the code. So I, I don't think it really is germane to anything that we have to be concerned about. But if you get back to uh, page five, again, the meat of the bill, uh, my question would be logistically now, uh, let's say one of the cities that I represent, and I agree, totally different from a data center, maybe from a warehouse. It's going to be very difficult for them to go out and estimate each one of those, right? So it would likely then fall under the per hour fee. That's the challenge right. I guess I have, though, would that not put a little bit of a burden on the person applying for the permit because they don't know what that cost would be, right? They don't know that cost is going to be $500 or $50,000 at that point, depending on how much effort. So I'm just trying to figure through the logistics and T's and C's here. That's right. I, I would say that more than likely, uh, a city or you know these owners these folks who are developing these commercial properties would probably go to a flat fee and that's that's the reality and, and that's under uh, you see under line 101 and line 99 it's going to be a flat fee for, for the most part More. but we give them that option to go to an hourly fee if you've got something that is maybe larger let's say you're, you're building a much larger and you say hey look these permit fees are going to be based on the amount of work that, that goes into it if you can imagine a multi-month project, something that takes 18 months, um, that's how they would estimate that. But if you've got a single family home or you've got a you know, small commercial building that you're building, you, you could pretty easily know what that's gonna be and how long it's gonna take you to permit it. So, so to follow up on, on what Senator Albers had said here, you're saying most likely they'll go to a flat fee, but I think his question was what if they go to the hourly rate? It sounds like you're not gonna know what your permit costs until after they're all done and the final inspection's done, if if they did that, sure. I I think until after you finish building, I, I think you'd probably be able to if you you know if you have the maps for a building, which is the mechanical electrical plumbing you know, and you're looking at this thing, you're basically going to know in a pre uh, pre planning meeting what it's going to be. You know, you're going to have an estimation. Now, if you're talking about a skyscraper, you won't have extensive. And, and and those guys who engineer those buildings know what those, you know, what those are going to be. But if we're, I mean, if we're looking at something probably under twenty thousand square feet, I'm submitting I'm submitting a set of plans uh, with maps to my local county. Th they're basically going to know, hey, this is going to take me, you know, twenty or thirty hours just based on that pre-planning meeting of what it's going to be. Uh, a lot of times they'll even send you a worksheet. Uh, I, I, I'll be frank, I'm, I'm building a commercial development now myself. Uh, and so they have it all listed out. They have this is what your mechanical fees are. This is what your electrical fees are. This is what all these these are. And it's based on you know knowing uh, what it's going to be and, and how, how long it's going to take them to do that job. Uh, follow, Mr. Chairman, if I could. Uh, and I appreciate the the, the spirit and the idea and, and the reasoning sure. for this. I, I'm just trying to again figure out in practicality 
for a flat fee, is that a flat fee no matter what, or is that a they determine a flat fee based on the information they have? Right. So it's a it's a flat fee plus they could do. So for example, they got a flat fee uh, for each business or practitioner, or a flat fee for each type of permit or inspection request. So you could either do it for a building, or you could do it per phase. So if you want to say your electrical inspection is a hundred dollars, uh, you know your plumbing inspection is a hundred dollars or fifty dollars, whatever it may be. They could do it that way. Uh, that would be all inclusive. So, right. if I'm a county, the way I count for that, I think, is really the inverse of the question is, as a county, how do I estimate my cost? Well, I know if I've got to do 100 inspections and this person costs me X amount of dollars, I can divide his time by the amount of inspections he needs to do, and I can come up with a estimated flat fee cost. Now, I can also do it hourly, but it's got to be based on the fee, and that's. I think that's what, what we're trying to get to here is it's got to be a fee that's closely as close as possible related to the actual cost of doing the regulatory activity and having that level of transparency uh, is just critical as you see our state continue to expand and grow and again I, I the premise of, of, of the idea of the legislation is fantastic I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how this happens when our local cities and counties are, are, are executing that. Sure. And my concern is, let's say it's a flat fee for $100 for electrical inspection for a building. If that building's six stories versus that building is 400 square feet, right? That, that could be a dramatically different amount of time and money. So I'm trying to figure out how do we, how do we bring, bridge that gap? I guess that's where I'm missing this. Uh, the beautiful thing is with this bill, even though we're taking out the square footage, we're still giving the cities the ability to have that local control and know what their permanent inspection fees can be. And they can set their own flat rates. We're not determining that rate for them. We're allowing them to do that themselves. Okay, last question, I'm sorry. I, sure. I don't mean to belabor you here, but uh, no, if the city sets a flat fee, as an example, or the county, yeah. they're either giving somebody a bill that's way too high or potentially way too low. I'm an advocate, probably, of the hourly fee. I like that. Um, because it's, it's as close as possible to the actual cost. But we know that we're gonna have some opposition here today, and you know they're really gonna kinda push us on, the, on, on what we're already doing. I would love to go based on an hourly myself, but we're trying to give them some flexibility to continue to operate in an easy manner. Thank you. But yes. you, would, you would agree back on that point that if they go to that hourly rate, because I've heard it both ways now, sure. they're not gonna know what they're paying until it's over with because they've got to do the inspection reinspections and all that I, i'm I, I i'm i'm also it's like the the intent is good i'm just worried sure. about the unintended consequences down the road is is what concerns me i will say in my experience i've never built anything that big so i couldn't tell you but uh you know anything over five six stories i mean that's outside of the my purview so i will will tell you that but when you're starting to build something that large uh there's going to th those conversations are already happening at either the hourly or the fee based rate with the counties and cities prior to the to the building uh, commencing all right yes. any other questions from the committee i've got a lot of people that want to speak here it looks like uh senator rett your number what four three three okay thank you for bringing this bill to the committee and thank you mr chairman i just got a simple question it might have been answered but if you go by an hourly rate how can you tell if the hourly rate is not inflated to the point where it's almost equal to the fee that they originally talked about charging? Well, those records will be public, and we, of course, we, we set the law here. Of course, anybody can break them, you know. Uh, but I, I w presumably they're going to follow the letter of the law here and, and make those as close to the hourly rate as possible. And again, you just take that salary, you can take the reasonable expenses. Uh, that's in line 106, 107, 108. So you can take an hourly cost and then you can break it down uh, with those reasonable expenses. All right. Any other questions? If not, if you'd have a okay. seat, we'll let Thank some you. people appreciate you bringing this to us. Um, we've got quite a few people that want to testify, so I'm going to ask that you keep it as brief as you can and, and would also ask that those that follow not repeat the same things if, if possible the first one on the list is james martin if you want to come up to the podium james and uh state your name and address and all that stuff to identify who you are yes sir thank you for having me my name is james martin i'm the president of the building officials association of georgia 
and building official for Rome in Floyd County, Georgia. Um, I'd like to start off saying there is an issue with permit fees and where they go in the state of Georgia. I don't work for every jurisdiction. I just know what we do. We do things right in Rome and Floyd County. Uh, but being the building official, I hear about these issues all the time. An example would be um, jurisdiction charging difference between a one and a half ton heat and air unit change out in the home versus a two and a half ton. It takes the same amount of time to do that. It doesn't matter. Same amount of time, same amount of man hours. So there is something to this bill. But where I have issues is, is with square footages, the types of buildings. If you'll look at the uh, lines 23 through 25, and if you read the existing law right now that's in place, almost in the same place, it says, but no local government is authorized to use regulatory fees as a means of raising revenue for general purposes. The law already exists. How are we enforcing the law now? So if we change the law, what is that gonna change? Probably nothing for the folks that are in violation of the law now. So if you read the existing law, it reads a little bit different, but it's the, it's the same exact thing for that section 23 through 25. Okay, so this is where the problem comes in is when you eliminate that five and six, I can agree with evaluation of cost. When you have evaluation of cost of a building, the building could be very different. It could have granite countertops, it could have laminate countertops. So the price of how much a building costs is not a valuable way to do this. The square footage per the ICC evaluation is the way to do it. The gentleman spoke of a warehouse occupancy versus a medical occupancy being different. That is true. But if you studied what that means in line five, it says per the International Code Council evaluation from time to time. So those different buildings are broke up by occupancy classifications, right? A warehouse is a S1 occupancy. The, the evaluation that ICC puts out is a lot lower. Roman Floyd County, we use $41 times the square footage times a multiplier. That multiplier is designed to change per the ICC regulations per what's your cost uh, to run your department, okay? A uh, medical facility, a true medical Floyd Medical Center is an I occupancy. So the square footage is, is not just a square footage calculation for these different buildings. So for someone to say that they're getting charged by square footage for a warehouse and a medical building is completely different by that ICC regulations. That's why that ICC was in the existing um, ordinance, the one that they're striking out. Uh, let's see which lines is it? Lines uh, 109 through 114. Um, that means something completely different than what they were saying. So each building has an occupancy classification assemblies, A2, restaurants, things of that nature, B, businesses, um, I, institutional, which are hospitals, S1s, which are storage buildings, warehouses. Those things are figured different. It's not a flat square footage if you follow the law now. Um, I can't, I don't know that all jurisdictions are following that law, but I'm assuming they're not because they're bringing up this issue. But to take line 109 through 114, is a big mistake in my opinion because we have to have a way to figure a permit based on the size of the building. The data for how much it costs, I completely agree with because each building is different. If you tried to build this building by how much it costs and get a permit by how much it costs, you'd be charged way more than if this was just a standard building. So it makes no sense um, to take 109 through 114 out. And we're here because we want to compromise. We agree that the bill is needed. We just do not agree with the way that it's written. And we would like to work with the mechanical contractors, the electrical contractors, the realtors, everyone to try to get this bill to where it needs to be so we can meet common ground. They get what they want. They're not getting charged $20,000 for a five ton heat pump in Valdosta versus uh, $73 in Rome, Georgia. We understand that there's a problem, but taking that square footage away will cripple the way the building inspection departments work in most jurisdictions. Again, I can't speak for everyone, just my jurisdiction. And like you said, okay, we have a million square foot warehouse coming 
in the north part of our county. What am I supposed to tell them? Hey, I, I'm not sure how much this is going to cost us, how many inspections we do, or man hours. So at the end of the construction job, I'm like, okay, you owe us $60,000. Instead of them knowing up front, it was $40,000 and everybody was happy. And we can't, this will affect housing, workforce housing. Right. If we charge a flat fee, okay, a man building a 6,000 square foot house, if we do a flat fee of say $2,000 uh, and, and a person wants to build a tiny home that's 600 and we charge them the same amount because it's a flat fee, how is that fair? It's not. We're not saying the bill's bad, we just want to make it better. Okay, and if I could ask you a quick question, because I know we've got to go on, but well, actually two questions. The, the, the code you talk about with these different classifications for hospitals and warehouses and stuff, mm -hmm. that's a national code? It is it's mandated by the state of Georgia. Those occupancy classifications are in the International Building Code that is adopted statewide and it's state mandated. To any, no one in the state of Georgia can adopt a different code per state regulations. So, all right, and, th and then the second question, so you're saying that your your funds are truly an enterprise funds that there, apparently there's people that this isn't the case of, but yours, so let's just say your, your department, it takes a million dollars to run it for mm -hmm. a year with rent, utilities and staff and all that stuff. So you're gonna, you're gonna need to adjust your fees to get that same million dollars because you, you're not supposed to give the general fund money and they're not supposed to give you money. So you're, you're just saying that it's, it's really not going to change the fees in your situation. It just may shift them to some people would get higher fees and some people would get lower fees maybe than what they have been getting. Is that, is that, is that, that's what I'm understanding. I believe it does not make it fair for the smaller folks. It'll make it better for the larger builders. Um, we'll, there'll be a way to figure out how to make it work regardless of if it's passed or not. But it's you. Do, you cannot. I don't see how you can do it. And not base it on a square footage. If you're following what the law says now, per the International Code Council. If you read that section and understand it and really study it, it was done in the past because it was the a, a way to get to a point. I agree with that. The evaluation of construction. We can't have it plywood's forty dollars instead of nine dollars, and that shouldn't. You shouldn't have to pay a more a permit fee because your OSB is more. We completely agree with that. It makes perfectly good sense. Okay. All right. We Thank appreciate you. your testimony, and we're going to move on. Um, let's see. Um, this is Cody Gunn, I believe it is. And, again, try not to be redundant on stuff. But Yes, sir. I'm Cody Gunn. I'm the chief building official of the city of Perry, and I'm with BOAG. I just wanted to speak on sort of the practical nature of how we were going to implement this. Uh, when this was brought to my attention, we ran the fee schedules, figured out what it would have to be. Like it was said before, it will end up costing more for this. The smaller the project, the more it'll cost. The bigger the project, the less it'll cost. It's fine. Um, as far as how it will actually, how Perry can implement it every year, the fees change slightly depending on, uh, you know, what our fees are, and it can go up or down by the multiplier. Every time we do that, it costs our software company around one or two thousand dollars a year to change that fee. We don't have, obviously, we're a small city, so we don't have a, an IT department. So, in order to get the fee schedule to change to follow what would be required here, it will cost the city of Perry eleven thousand dollars for technology, Tyler Technologies, to change it because the reporting has to change. It's a lot of coding. How it's done every year will cost slightly more too. It'll be uh, maybe a couple thousand dollars a year instead of a thousand. And they believe it'll take us, take them five to seven months to actually get the software developed for us to do it. So I'm, I'm primarily speaking to the effective date of however this goes either way. We would need a, a pretty substantial amount of time. It's five to seven months to get us into testing in our experience with technology based on sort of how good everybody's at using the testing programs. It should take an additional one or two months just to get into the program to where it's working functionally. So we could be at six months a, as a low point. So I want to make sure however this goes, I understand there is an issue that it could be solved and worked out between the whole groups. But when it is practically decided on by the committee and it, it becomes a requirement, we will need time um, to handle just the IT version, the IT 
functions to make sure that we're in compliance. All right. Thank you for the testimony. And I guess whatever those costs are are still charged to that enterprise fund. Yeah. yeah. It'll, it'll, it'll go right back it'll into go, that. Go into it, yeah. Okay, thank you. We've got Austin uh, Hackney, I believe. It's the Home Builder Association, if you want to testify. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and um, thank you to Representative Momtaham for bringing this uh, bill forward. Uh, my name is Austin Hackney. I'm here representing the Home Builders Association of Georgia, I'm a uh, constituent of Senate District 36. So uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I wanted to uh, express our support of House Bill 302 and let you know that in 2021, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 52,194 single family permits were pulled in the state of Georgia, which is great news. That's as m that's more than we've pulled in any year since 2011. Uh, so it's uh, it has gone up every year since that that low trough. Um, those are just single family houses. Um, if you include multifamily um, buildings, so that would be duplexes all the way up to full size apartment buildings that brings the number up to 65,167 building permits across the state. And as you've heard already, those permits, um, you know, can run the gamut for how much they cost um, each. And I do have a couple of examples I wanted to share with you. And um, before I do, I wanted to thank our building officials who came today for being here and, uh, and for the work that they do. Um, you know, these guys are charged with enforcing the building codes. So uh, while they lead their departments, they're not necessarily the finance directors for the cities and counties that are setting the budget for the departments. And, uh, and so before I get into the numbers that I've got, I, I just wanted to say that you know, these guys in the room are, are professionals and, and we appreciate the partnership that, that they have with uh, the home builders and their communities. Um, I did want to give you a couple of examples of permitting costs and uh, without naming these jurisdictions by name and I'm sure you can make the guesses and I'd be happy to talk to you offline about the specifics but in Metro Atlanta there are some jurisdictions that charge uh, for um, just anecdotally um, I was talking to a builder earlier today about a uh, 3,800 square foot house that he builds in multiple jurisdictions, right? He uses the same house plan, and this is a very nice house that costs him probably $650,000, depending on the cost of materials to build. And um, so in one jurisdiction uh, nearby, um, he spent $4,113 on the building permit, uh, another $1,028 on the plan review, of the uh, just of the house for the site plan review was another eight hundred and fifty dollars um, this particular community requires a, a builder to put a sidewalk in front of the house so um, if he does that then he pays for the sidewalk if if they choose not to do that then he pays into the sidewalk fund and the city comes by later to install their own sidewalk so for this particular house uh, they measure it fifty dollars per um, foot for linear foot on the road so that lot was 50 feet wide so he paid $2,500 into the sidewalk fund and the tree fund is another uh, permit that a builder has to pull for a, a new home in this particular case he had one tree on the lot and paid uh, of course he paid the the arborist to come remove the tree he paid the city a tree recompense fee of $10,320. And then the city also required him to plant 12 trees, uh, which were three inches each in diameter, uh, which cost about $1,000 per tree. So, um, you know, once he gets all that done, there's some other uh, hoops to jump through, pervious and impervious. So uh, it has to do with whether the water can go into the ground or if it gets uh, if it hits the roof or the driveway. So um, in some cases, if there isn't enough pervious space on the lot, uh, he may be required to use a certain type of paver that will let that water go through. And so where you might have a low cost for a concrete pad, if you got to use these pervious pavers, that could add an additional $10,000. Um, if that same um, kind of water control uh, requirement requires them to put a cistern 
under the driveway or uh, which could be a huge concrete tank uh, to capture all the water runoff. In some cases they can get away with just a pit with gravel in the bottom, accomplishes the same goal for a little bit less, but uh, that's going to be another $10,000. Okay, but let me ask you a question here. Isn't that more of a, a building standard where communities have different building standards? Yes and I no. I mean, that's going to be there either way, isn't it? Well, whether, whether, whether we say there's an inspection fee or not, if they say you've got to have sidewalks, that charges, those things really are kind of different than what we're talking about here, it seems to me. But. They can be. I mean, you can't build a new house without complying with those requirements, which are, you know, different per local jurisdiction. And I think one of the things we want to talk about today is some consistency across local jurisdictions. So, you know, not every um, local community requires a new home to pay into a tree recompense fee or a sidewalk mm -hmm. uh, fund. Um, so, um, you know, those are requirements of the local government, but they're not requirements of the statewide construction code. But I mean, that's really not, we're not going to fix that in this bill. We're not. Uh, but I did want to give you some examples of what you mm -hmm. as a homeowner might have to pay. Right. I, I, I mean, different communities have different standards for, you know, what they want to do. Homeowners associations do too. And, you, you know, if you want to live there, I guess you got to go by it or you got to vote out the people that are doing that. But, you know, that that's really not these fees, I guess I, I wouldn't think. But. Well, um, I guess my interpretation of the regulatory fees that uh, that we're talking about would be all of these fees. And so if we're requiring a, uh, for a building permit that you comply with these extra steps, whether it's uh, you know a plan review fee or a site plan review fee or a sidewalk fee, I, I think that they're going to have to show their math in the same calculations that we're talking about here today. So then you know the the sidewalk fees i mean are they going to have to take money from the general fund to build sidewalks because they're saying we can only charge them a certain fee and I, i'm i'm getting lost here i guess on this well uh maybe that's a good example with how confusing some of these uh fees can be when they start to stack on top of each other and and uh one thing that we talk about in our, in our home builders association and and we talk about with you here at the legislature is housing affordability and and what can state government do about it and some of these local fees fit that bill this is what we can do about housing affordability um, you know we just talked about forty thousand dollars in local fees um, and you know that's a big house in a nice community but the same house in a different community may be fifteen hundred dollars in fees that that homeowner has to pay so to your point they can choose where they want to live and and if they know that going into it they can make that choice um, our position on the bill as we support its passage is for two main reasons and so i'll wrap up with that uh, the existing language that the fee must approximate the cost of the service makes a lot of sense and and we think that's good government um, to add to that that the money that gets pulled in has to be spent in the department we think reinforces what's what's already on the books and is just a, a good way to run that and uh, I think m maybe you Mr. Chairman had asked if uh, there were any examples of that not occurring even though it's already in state law and certainly the Home Builders Association has been successful suing different local governments uh, around the state uh, and winning those cases when those high fees have have been charged or when those monies have been spent in uh, areas of the government's budget that were not approved. Uh, the other reason that we support this bill is because, uh, I think it's already been mentioned, but the, the materials pricing that went crazy last year, uh, you know, didn't have anything to do with inspection costs. And so when the price of a house goes up because the materials went up, we'd hope that the, um, that the legislature could step in and say, you know what, the permit fee doesn't need to follow that materials price increase. There's no connection there um, in reality. So we hope there will be some separation on the fee schedule. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Uh, Senator Albers, you had one question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really, I completely understand what you're talking about and have lived through that. And I really commend the, the bill's author. What I think might make sense, because this is a committee hearing only, is is maybe a handful of us huddle after this to come up with a couple of creative ways. And one of the challenges I have found in my 12 years of doing this now 
is when there's a couple people that have problems, sometimes we force feed the rest of the state cough drops uh, as opposed to addressing the three or four that have the cough. Uh, and I just want to make sure that in our, in our effort to fix a problem that does exist, I completely agree, and specifically with some of the examples that you cited, uh, I want to just make sure we find out a way to do that in a way that doesn't cause others harm that don't need it. So if you'd be willing to do that, I'd love to work with you and the bill's author. Uh, uh, fair enough. You know, we, we talked about the different uses and how those could be calculated per use. You know, I'm only here to talk about single family home use. Uh, there are certainly lots of other examples that would be outside of my purview, so I um, appreciate the opportunity to address you, and uh, thank you. All right, we appreciate your testimony. I think we've got Les Snyder up next, and I'm, I'm hearing that you've got your fingerprints on this bill in a few areas maybe that, that wasn't the author's. If thank you. Members of the committee, my name is Les Schneider. Um, I'm here because I was involved in 1992 in the study committee that actually created the occupational tax law and the regulatory fee makeup and I just want to make sure there's no confusion among the committee about why this bill is being brought forth here. Um, Chairman, as you indicated on pages uh, on page two lines 23 to 25, this is to hit home because of the three or four suits. One of them was the Cab County, where they basically charged three or four or five or six million dollars over the cost of uh, the cost of their department. Um, I have been involved in a lot of discussions with local governments where they overcharged for fees, and eventually those were all amicably worked out. So, as Senator Albers has talked about, this does go uh, occur across the state. And it's just to reemphasize that when you all pass the occupational tax, that was to raise revenue. And local governments can raise as much revenue as they want under the occupational tax. But on the regulatory fees, it's only supposed to cover the cost of regulation when they do their various permits. And it's not just construction. It's, it's a lot of other types of uh, regulatory fees that exist in, in a local government that they have the right to do. Now, on lines 29, the, uh, I guess uh, the representative indicated on lines 26, these were examples of the regulatory fees that at the time that the study committee met, that these were all the examples of some of the regulatory fees that local governments actually assessed. And the reason some of these now are being crossed out in lines 31, line 34, 39, and 22 is because the subsequent law changed. Um, taxis and limos are now regulated on the state level only. Shooting galleries and firearms because of the changes that were made in that and firearms dealers. There are state laws that preempt local law in this area. Um, wrestling, you see boxing is out. The Boxing Commission on the state level takes care of all boxing. Local governments don't regulate boxing. They still regulate wrestling. So, um, and on lines 90 and 92, uh, the reason that those are in there now is because when you look back on line 60, these are the items that at the time the study committee met, these are all the professions that were only regulated on the state level, not on the local level. And you're now seeing added to lines 90 and 92 because of the law changes the General Assembly has made to various laws relating to firearms. Now sports shooting ranges and firearm dealers are all regulated just on the state level, not on the local level. So those are the reasons for those changes. Um, let me address on page five, because I think Senator Albers has made some interesting points, but I don't want the committee to get lost in some of the other comments that have been made today. When the law was first passed, lines 99 through 108 is what was part of the law. The, the issue was that local governments should be able to set their regulatory fees as long as those regulatory fees do not exceed the cost of regulation. They came and testified and we looked at the various fees that existed at the time and as the representative indicated, many jurisdictions used a flat fee. Some of them used, just used a, a fee that was tied to a specific type of inspection. Others used an hourly rate tied into it. But those were the methodologies that they used. And from 1992 to the time when these two other sections were done, there was not a problem. They were able to say our budget 
for all the people and the building and the computers and the infrastructure, it's $2 million a year. So they knew that that was their budget and they had to work backwards to figure out what do we charge for the various inspections. And therefore, they were able to do that without any problem. No one is stopping anyone from using other information. The problem that occurred is, let's say Senator Albers and I have exactly the same roof on our house, but Senator Albers paid $10,000 for his roof, he got a great deal, and I got the same roof, but it cost me $15,000. What certain jurisdictions were doing was charging the permit fee based on the percentage of the price of the, of the job. So he only paid 5% of $10,000, where I was paying 5% of $15,000. That has to stop because it has nothing to do with the cost of regulation. Now, if somebody has a 10-story building and you know the, the department figures, well, we know that it's going to take us approximately 10 hours or whatever, they can work up their fee and they could tie it to the one, uh, one or a combination of items one through four. But the problem is, is that there have been a lot of jurisdictions that start using the price of the project to determine the amount of the fee. That's where the biggest problem is, and that has to be eliminated. And you can see on line one yeah, six. Yeah. They're cutting out two sections. Right, and I was going to. It sounds like you're more for the. Uh, I'm sorry. sorry, my mic's not on. Yeah. We're, we're cutting out two sections, the last two, but it sounds like you're arguing for the, the fifth section, the square footage on the roof versus the price of the roof. Well, what, I, what I'm saying is, uh, uh, Senator, is that. The cost of the project is completely objectionable. It doesn't make any sense. There's no tie-in between it. Mm -hmm. The issue on the next one is a department, and they've oh, they did this from 1992 to whenever four and five, five and six were added. They know what their budget is to run the department. They know how many people they have. They know the building they have. They have all their cost structure. So let's assume their budget to run this department is two million dollars. They know approximately what's going the kind of building activity they're going to have during the course of a year. No one's asked them to come up with complete perfection in terms of hitting the dollar amount perfectly. But they've always been able to figure out, because of their experience, that when they look at an air conditioner and sending somebody out and looking at it, it's a four-hour job. They can figure out what they pay that person, what the overhead cost has to be, and they come up with a fee schedule, and the vast majority of jurisdictions do a fine job. The trouble is when you start automatically saying that the building valuation data that ties into these international code councils, I've seen this, and I've seen where money and, and prices get tied into the so cost so of your the biggest objection is the, is the last one, number six. Right, but number five has problems, too, because you can still solve for di getting the thing done by just using one through four. And, uh, and I can just tell you, based on my experience of dealing with a lot of the cities and counties, you can eliminate the problem because no one is saying that they can't say, well, you know, is a six-story building, are we going to deal with that the same way a four-story building is? They may figure, well, look, each floor is going to take us about five hours to get through. So if it's five hours and it takes six, uh, you have six-story building, it may take 30 hours. I agree with the previous gentleman that the, the, the capability of the local officials is there. They can work the budget out. All I'm saying is, is that we are creating a great deal of mischief by leaving in five and six. But, but if, we, if, we, mm -hmm. if we have that $2 million fund and they're – the, the people that are doing it right, you know, mm -hmm. that aren't, aren't cheating, they're still going to need to get that $2 million to pay for it one way or another. So, There's no question. So the, the fees are going to go up for some people and go down for others. Not, some people are going to get fee increases if you do it this way. My, my experience has been that normally it is, it is not a matter of by eliminating five and six, you're not stopping any local government from factoring in the size of a building, et cetera. But what we have to be focused on is how long does it take 
for the local official to do the inspection? How long does it take for them to fill out the paperwork, check things out? It's more of a labor issue than it is a square feet issue. And I think that's where the focus has, 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 has gone awry, and that's why you have some of the examples that look so strange. And all I'm saying is, is that for 20 plus years, we did one through four, and there was never a problem. People were able to figure out. The only problem we ever had is when the overall budget was dramatically exceeded by the amount of revenue that was brought in. So All right. Uh, and one other thing, just yes, to, to sure. bring it up, is yeah, they can they can adjust for all that, and usually they're going right. to have a little bit of a fund balance because you don't know when a recession is going to hit, and they're only going to get half the applications that year, or maybe there's a boom, you get double applications. So over the long haul, it, it evens out, but it can be a problem in the, in the short haul as oh, well. Senator, oh. Senator Alvarez wanted to ask a question. Sure. Here. I'll give you the name of my roof guy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I. I First, I uh, agree with the chairman completely. I mean, uh, Section 6, starting on line 115, is a no-brainer. I mean, that's right. that's an easy strike. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at math. Would I not just, if you were to strike the section above it, would I not just take out my cell spreadsheet, pop in how many square feet there was, base it on my labor anyway, and then give you a fixed flat fee, which is basically what we were paying for to begin with? And the concern I have with, with your point is, is that when you see the phrase building valuation data on line 111, the question is, is the building valuation data, is that tied to price of construction? Is the building valuation data tied into other factors? As you can see in on line 113, this is all of this is supposed to be limited by the hourly rate as described in three and four above. So my point is, is that if everything is limited by three or four above, then why isn't one, two, three, and four sufficient to be able to do the pricing for the permits? The trouble is, is that the cost of construction or the, or, or the standard set by the International Code Council has price factors in it, and that should have nothing to do with how much and it does to do an inspection. And I think that's the overriding task. But your suggestion is a good one. There's certainly nothing wrong in sitting and talking further to try to figure it out. I agree with you, number six is more than a no-brainer. I mean, it, it, it's exactly what's caused a lot of problems. The question becomes, even if you don't have five, what stops you from using the first four to make the same accurate determination of what the fee should be so that the cost of regulation doesn't exceed the price of the permit. One more question, if I could, Mr. Chairman. And, and I agree what, what you're saying, Les. I, I think maybe there's a pony somewhere in between five and what the language exists and what could be done. Could uh, be. With the, I, but I agree. Anytime we're basing something just off of the value of the materials and cost of the job uh, is, is just a fool's errand. So. And that's where most of the problems have occurred in the state. And I don't, think they, I don't think cities and counties get up in the morning and just want to do something mean. I think what happens is it becomes too easy because I've seen consultants come to cities and counties and say, Ugh, I got a better way to do this. Whatever the cost of the job is, just charge them 2% or 3%. You'll make enough money. And that's, that's not, it's, it goes against what you all have said in the law three or four times. This is not a revenue raiser. This is supposed to just cover the cost of regulation. A absolutely. Uh, and I just want to reiterate my concern. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Is, is we don't force feed cough drops to, you know, 350-some-odd cities if, if a handful of the ones that are problematic. Yeah. And my only response to that is, is I, I would guess that the other 300 cities that you're talking about or counties, they don't use five and six. They use one to four, and they're not having any problems. And that's what I'm saying. I think that five creates a lot of mischief. And I would just say, unless somebody can show you a compelling example where it would have to be done, I think they can get it all done of one, one through four. Because I, I'm not, I don't like to spend my time talking to city and county attorneys and then having talked to the folks in the building department, and they all sit there and say, yeah, I guess we, we, we messed up or we made a mistake and we need to fix it. And most of the industry doesn't want to spend their time 
you know, fighting building inspectors and things like that, because those people, as you say, may not set the budget. But this is not a hard budgetary process. Just like you all look at a budget, and then you figure out, well, how do we get enough right, revenue? We, we, we're going to we're gonna have to get going here. Thank you very um, much. Th thanks for your testimony. All right. We've got uh, Tucker Green with the Conditioned Air Association up next. Um, and while he's getting up there, I'll tell you, I'm, my, my brother does heating and air. My, my dad and my granddad did. So there's three generations of heating and air. But I've been a county commissioner, so I've seen this from both sides. Uh, hot air, yeah, a lot of hot air. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I didn't like snakes under houses. It, I didn't really want to Hard see that. <laughs> Hard work, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. <laughs> found, found a lot of snakes here, yeah. My, my, my family is in the heat and air business, and you see where I am today. So uh, great respect for them, though. But uh, thank you, committee. I'll, I'll be very brief because uh, Les uh, touched on many points. I, I would just say very simply uh, for us, and uh, there was a letter of support in, uh, in your folders, I believe, for – over 14 construction related groups i would say very simply for us as he talked about on page two this is cementing state law already that the regulatory fee should follow the regulatory activity that's all what it comes down to and simply on page five the simple matter is those two methods have nothing to do with the regulatory activity they have nothing to do with what it costs for those inspections very simply um, what i would tell you is that we do have cases all over this state come up regularly from my heat and air contractors plumbers electricians home builders all over of where they are hit with astronomical fees across this state and in fact i would say more cases than are reported to us because often they don't like to ruffle feathers in their jurisdictions because they have to deal with these inspectors in these cities and counties on a regular basis and so they don't report these things now i'm not saying i'm not picking on on inspecting departments. In fact, I had a great conversation with these BOAG officials, and I thank them for the job they do and, and commend these. And I think them being here shows they are probably the four good ones, four, four of the good ones in this state. And I, I commend them for what they do. And, and um, Joe Rodriguez in particular, we have a great relationship, CAG does, and we work closely with him, and, and they do great work. And, and we look forward to working closely with BOAG. And, um, but as they even acknowledged uh, in one method in particular, you know, it, it's just not applicable to what's going on as far as their inspection. And I think what I would echo to you and leave you with is that convenience or just because this is the way we've done it should not mean that we negate the state law that those fees should follow the activity, what, what it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be. A I don't think anybody record. on this committee will disagree. And, you know, if this other language is better, I'm not a lawyer. I don't see that much difference between what was there saying you can't use this versus the new way that says you can't use this. I mean, there must be a difference there I'm not seeing. But I think we all agree that money should not go anywhere else, and we need to have ways to, to go after people that use it for other purposes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Tucker, for your testimony. Um, we've got uh, Brad Mock with Georgia Realtors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. And, and we've spoken with a lot of you guys, so I won't belabor any of those points that we uh, have already covered with y'all. I think a lot of the points have been covered today. It seems like if you work it backwards from six back, six is the big problem. From a realtor standpoint, uh, there's an inconsistency when you work in one county and pay $8,000 for uh, the permitting process on a dental office, and you work in the city next door to that county and you pay $38,000. That seems to be problematic, right? And we have that example if anybody wants it. So there's gaps. I totally agree that everybody's not doing it. There's 540 cities in this state. There's 159 counties. There's no way everybody's doing the wrong thing, but there are some folks that are not doing it correctly, and it seems to be pretty problematic, and that's a big swing in cost. I know there were some questions earlier that, I, from our perspective, the, the two big ends, if you want to know what the realtors care about the most, six and six is a huge problem. You know, you can take that down to the micro level when you add a deck to your house and it was gonna cost 5%, and then lumber goes up three and a half times what it was, and now your permit costs three and a half times what it did with zero change to inspection, right? These guys are smart guys, and I know they talk to each other because more than one of them are here today. So some of the concept that you know we may not know as a building official how to, or how long it may take to inspect something, I bet somebody has done it. 
And I bet that conversation can be had to get an estimate of how much time it may take, or they could create their own formula for how long they take on a thousand square foot and then multiply it out because that would, that would work within one through four, I think is kind of to Les's point when he was discussing this earlier. You know, Austin hit an example of a $10,000 tree. We've got some of those as well. Uh, the section that is added, Mr. Chairman, I agree that it doesn't seem like that big of a change, but apparently it's enough in lines 22 to 25 where you can't charge a regulatory fee for something that you as a city or county do not regulate. That seems to be the heart of that, uh, and that's something that we care about a lot because there's a lot of fees and licenses and permits that get applied to things that are not regulated any differently than other properties or other functions. Why does their tree cost them $10,000 because it's a blank acre that they would like to build on when I want to get my tree cut down right next door since I already own the property? It doesn't cost me that because I'm not new construction. What's the difference? There doesn't seem to be one. So if there's no change in regulation, it's just a change in property, or it's just a change in who owns the property, then why is there a fee schedule difference? And, and we do see some of that. So I think those things will be solved there. Those are our biggest concerns. We'd love to uh, stay after uh, Senator Albers. I think that's a great idea. We'd love to talk with you guys from BOAG as well to have those conversations. But those are our biggest concerns, and those are the reasons that we support this bill. We're on the letter as well. And if you'd like to hear from some realtors in your areas, we can sign them up. All right. and and. From my way of thinking, those people that do the $10,000 tree, or they say you have to have sidewalks or impervious service, I don't see that going away. I mean, they just may shift it and say, well, here's your fee, but here's what's required. I, I mean, I'm, I'm missing. The fee, I think, and sir, I'm not an attorney, but, but I think, sir, the, the language that uh, in the front here, 22 to 25, the regulatory fee, uh, the proceeds to fund such regulatory activity, Mm -hmm. They can't demonstrate a difference in the activity of regulation, so I believe that would change the fee. When okay, it costs but, me but 500 a, bucks, if you have a fee, but then they say, "Here's a fee for inspecting the building." By the way, you got to put in sidewalks. Right. You're still going to pay for the sidewalks. The sidewalk one, I may not have an answer for it. The things like the trees and the other stuff that mm -hmm. that I think is a space where they're not regulating that tree any differently than they were on my property. I just am not a new construction. My house was built in 1997. So when I want to cut 11 trees down, they charge me 500 bucks for a permit. But if Senator Payne wants to build a new construction right around the corner because the neighborhood values have gone up, now it costs him a fortune to do it. Or if you want to build a home with granite countertops, all of a sudden you have to pay that much more. I think those things do fit together in the regulatory activity. And I think that's the space that is separate from uh, what our friends with BOAG have mentioned as far as the square footage situation goes. Okay. Because that has nothing to do with it, right? And I, I think, Senator Albers, that may also apply to your IT question, where that's a very different inspection than an open warehouse. Those, well, we've got thing. some time for everybody to yes, sir. talk about that Absolutely. before we bring it back, but those are the questions I have. Thank okay. you so much for letting thanks, us come thanks up. Thanks for your testimony. Um, we've got Todd Edwards here from ACCG. And then I know Ryan's here from GMA. Y'all doing it together separately, or you guys are on the same page on this one? Is that? We are on the same page on this one. Okay. Um, so if you don't mind us, us appearing up here together. Okay. Um, thank you, Chairman Huff, several members of the committee. Ryan Bowers talks with the Georgia Municipal Association. Appreciate you allowing me to be here today. Speak in opposition of uh, House Bill 302. Thank you, Representative Moftahan. You're always willing to talk to us about the legislation. Of course, we just don't agree this time, but thank you for always being willing to meet. Um, I'll, I'll speak extremely briefly here. I know we've covered a ton, and we have a, a number of local officials who are much better experts in this area than we are. Um, GMA's opposition to House Bill 302 is entirely based on those changes found in lines 109 through 120. That is where most of the discussion has been today. Um, just deviating from this broadly accepting manner of determining these fees requires a lot of cities to go through a process and rebalance out these structures. It just provides some uncertainty for cities and the public and risks the funding of these offices uh, for the services they provide, which are aimed at health, safety, and welfare of the public. Um, specific to the current practice, uh, Senator Elbers, you kind of mentioned the predictability to the development community at the beginning of a project. We believe that the, these methods do help with the predictability, where a switch to the other methods allowed in law would, would risk some of that predictability in the beginning of the project. Um, I know there are concerns over these provisions. I think our opposition is mainly based on the removal of these provisions 
and then asking us to just figure out to rebalance these out uh, quickly if there were another alternative solution or anything like that um, or just some time to try to f work with these adjustments it would be appreciated but I appreciate the committee's time and willingness to listen to our concerns here and taking these into consideration um, I will yield yield for questions with, with Todd but we do have a lot of experts here that that'll help with those questions as well so okay. thank you all very much okay. no questions from the committee thank you Okay, thank we've got. Um, oh, I, if you, I'll you I, in fact, I'll be brief, more brief. I wanted to okay. thank Ryan for your comments. I'm Todd Edwards with the uh, Association of County Commissioners, and I'll uh, again keep it very brief. We have some experts that have been called in, and that's what we do with every bill. Uh, when we get to legislation of the General Assembly, you can't can't know all the uh, the issues surrounding it, so we call in our, our building officials with the As Building Officials Association of Georgia. They're here. Uh, they've stated what much I much of what I had in my notes. They're doing a fine job. Uh, like GMA, our only concerns were with, one, were with 109, lines 109 through 120 of the bill. If there's some sort of solution that can be found or worked out between the building officials, the other groups represented here today, on their expert testimony, their advice, recommendations, and moving forward, any input that they're uh, able to provide in the process. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of your committee, I would uh, urge, and it's not a no vote here today, but to continue working on this legislation to try to find some middle ground. All Thank right. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, we've got two more. The, the third one gave up and left, I think, so uh, he spared you all his testimony, it looks like. Uh, is that Joe, Jim Walker? I'm the Chambly here. Okay. Sorry, I butchered that up. I couldn't read it. That's all right. It's John Walker, uh, city manager for the city of Shambly, Georgia. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to try not to repeat anything that's been said here, but I apologize if I do. Uh, the current method of calculating fees based on the value of construction utilizes a, uh, a type of construction uh, methodology that's put forth by the International Code Council. That's a nonprofit professional organization. Uh, with the sole purpose of, uh, you know, promoting safety and safe construction. Um, I want to kind of go back to something that was said about uh, why do we use that. And um, one of the things with cities uh, and counties around Georgia, we would be, we would take our cough drop if it were given to us uh, and make something work. Uh, but I would point out that ICC is a, a known quantity. It's a national agency. They've done this. This is what they do as opposed to each individual city or county uh, conducting our own fee studies uh, and fee schedules and creating our own data, which none of that data exists right now uh, with regards to hourly rates and hourly uh, work. Um, as far as, you know, if we were to move forward with something like this, for the most part, local governments do not currently work on a pay-as-you-go system. Um, what we currently do is we have uh, permitting software. Uh, we manage those very similar to project management. Um, this will require, and you heard earlier, that uh, most cities will need new software. We will need to be able to track individual inspections. We will need to be able to track uh, hours. Uh, and we will need to be able to bill. Uh, and we'll probably you know, have to bill uh, per inspection during the inspection, very similar to when someone comes out to your to your house to fix your air conditioning unit, you pay on site. You'll probably end up having to do that with the uh, with the inspectors. Um, I do believe that that's going to create some uncertainty, uh, and it's co definitely going to change how the structures are now. Um, I can envision uh, tracking uh, hours uh, would also add to the cost of administrative support and its administrative uh, needs, uh, whether it's through financial billing uh, staff or, uh, or administrative staff. But it's going to be a change and create a kind of incon more inconsistencies, not more standardization. Um, for each project, uh, if you have a house of you know, a certain square footage, uh, the same square footage in the same jurisdiction, you're going to pay the same cost based on those fees. That's the way it is with our jurisdiction. That's the way it is with most jurisdictions that I'm aware of. I do understand that there may be some bad actors out there, and I'm not going to suggest that there aren't. Um, however, if you go to a different system, uh, what you are going to see is uh, costs may be variable based on location of the project. Um, projects that are located in more rural areas uh, are going to take longer to get to. Uh, projects that are located uh, away from other 
uh, projects are going to take more time to get to, and so you're going to have travel costs. You're going to have uh, density uh, issues, uh, projects that uh, a whole neighborhood going in, uh, you can send inspectors there for the day, they can spend the day. Uh, you're going to have lower uh, overall fees because your hours are going to be covered and you're going to have less travel cost as opposed to sending someone out to a project that's not near any other projects. Um, errors in work, and I don't think we've talked about this, but there are problems with some builders, and they do not get it right the first time, some more often than others. Um, and so when there are errors in work now, we have a reinspection fee typically, uh, and we go back out, we, we do as much of the inspection as possible, we send people back out to do the inspection the next day for a nominal fee. Um, but we may spend quite a lot of time based on the errors that we find. Um, in, in a house or in a commercial business. Um, so we will not be able to guarantee, uh, you know, that it's gonna take six hours to do your 6,000 square foot uh, building or 10,000 square foot building. It's gonna be based on the quality of the construction. Um, and that is going to be uh, an unknown for anyone uh, doing work uh, in, in the community. And then finally, the size of the project. You know, the current fee structure takes size into account. It's based on the square footage, based on the construction type. Um, but without that, if we do go to an hourly fee, uh, you could have the size of a structure uh, and the complexity of a project uh, could very easily change uh, the fees uh, that are going to need to be collected on site. Uh, and they could differ from what you estimate at the beginning of the project. Um, I think it's been said before that this will impact uh, the lower valued projects more uh, and increase those costs. And I do believe uh, it was mentioned about affordability uh, by the real estate group. Uh, I believe that this will have an impact on increasing costs on the smaller projects, uh, which can lead to some affordability issues. Um, and then finally, I'll just say, um, I'd like to understand if there's another state uh, that, that's currently doing this because my understanding is that most states uh, throughout uh, the United States are using ICC, are using building valuation tables uh, to uh, assess their fees. Um, it should be pointed out that we currently have the ability uh, to go to an hourly rate or to flat fees, but that hasn't been done. Some of that is because we are using uh, a national nonprofit for the data, and we don't have data uh, collected on uh, you know, the amount of hours needed. Uh, but I've not seen in any other state where they have eliminated uh, the ability to use building valuation tables. And uh, so without the data and without uh, understanding uh, why, how other people might be doing it differently, I would just say that since we do have uh, the ability uh, to, to charge by hourly rate or flat fee now, uh, I would just ask that prior to mandating a change uh, that we look at uh, possibly working with cities who would be interested in making the change and seeing what the cost would be, seeing how much it would cost to do a fee study um, how much it would cost to change the software, and providing some, uh, some funding uh, for some sample jurisdictions to try that if they are interested. That's all I have. I'm going to put my mic back on Joel Rodriguez to speak to us. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joel Rodriguez uh, representing the Building Officials Association of Georgia. I serve as a director at large. Also serve on the State Codes Advisory Committee as the incoming chairman for the next round, um, work out of the Gwinnett jurisdiction. I would like to make, there was a statement made, and, and I'd like to notice that inspectors don't work by themselves. They're part of a building department, so they're part of a group that supports that service. That service overall gets regular reviews by the insurance service office. They're the ones that look at the number of fees we collect for the type of inspections, how much time, the certifications, the training, and hours. So we get people looking at the effectiveness of, of each building department. They come up with a risk for each community. So we have certain standards we've got to maintain that are above and beyond just that trip charge to, to get to that site. Also, as, par as part of the good guys that are potentially going to take the cough drop, 
you know, eliminating those two most common ones would be very disruptive without enough lead time and transition periods. It should be something that, that will possibly have some unintended consequences as well uh, as far as being interpreted. So whichever way we go, we, we feel there's a way to resolve this, working together with our customers and contractors and our jurisdictions and the building officials to come up with possibly some guidelines, best practices that could be reviewed and go forward with that. You know, it's been many years since ICC published those things. The books have updated over time, and maybe it's time we revisit it and look at what the current standards and recommendations are as we might adapt them to Georgia. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. We appreciate your testimony, and, um, you know, this is the, the first meeting we've got. We've got plenty more, but we've got some work to do on, on this House bill that's got to get perfected by the Senate, you know, so... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, anyway, we do appreciate you bringing this forth. You know, there's 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 several problems here. One is people not following the law, and we're going to reinforce that this is the law. I'm not sure what else, what steps other than that. And then there's the the fairness of the fees, and you know, we we can look at all those issues and see what we can come up with. So I hope everybody work together. I I do like. You know, looking at other states, when we did our surprise billing that I was involved in, we got stuff from New York, from Texas, from Washington, a lot of places, and said, my ideas might, I might think I've got some great ideas, but here's one that actually works here. We know it works. We know this works. We know this works, and put them in place. And I don't want this committee to put out something that has some unintended consequences, and, and somebody behind me is trying to fix it, you know, so. Uh, anyway, with that, I appreciate everybody being here. I appreciate the testimony. In my, this is my six years finance chair. This is probably one of the longest meetings we've had. It's got to be in the top two or three. You guys know how I like to have quick meetings, but this one needs some, some time to work on, and we appreciate everybody working on it. Meeting adjourned.